We have a returning guest, Fiorella Isabel, and she is on the Convo Couch. It's a great YouTube show. I've been watching her a long time. So Fiorella, thanks so much for coming back on. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you for having me. No problem. Yeah. I love so, it. Um, I think the 2020 primary was a disaster. Um, it was one of the worst primaries I've seen. I mean, you mentioned the rigging. You also mentioned the coronation and how everybody stepped down because Obama gave them a phone call. Then Hillary Clinton also got involved. The entire establishment got involved. Um, but apart from that, there was also corruption within the Bernie Sanders campaign. People at the very top level of his campaign staff were sort of really never in it to win it. And right after they went out and did a, 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 a giant super PAC for the purpose of uh, getting Joe Biden elected. And so it was literally everything. And then you add the pandemic to that. And a lot of people, you know, understand that Sanders felt he had to drop out because he didn't want to expose more people. Contrary to Joe Biden, who didn't mind exposing like exposing people to the disease, he is the kind of person that decided, hey, like I, I, you know, I have to drop out. But to a lot of people, a lot of the supporters, it did feel like he dropped out way too soon. He gave up way too quickly. He didn't take the gloves off. He wasn't saying things like, you know, um, Joe Biden is a liar. He wouldn't flat out say something like that. He wouldn't really go after his disastrous policy record enough and people wanted him to take the gloves off and he didn't do that so um that's that's like how i feel like every single thing that could have went wrong for bernie sanders went wrong uh and and you add to that of course like i said the pandemic and it, it was just a disaster you know it's a disaster we saw how the primaries went um we're seeing new results come in we just saw idaho where bernie sanders won about 42 percent of the state it's a red state that just tells you that Joe Biden is likely going to lose to Donald Trump because Joe Biden isn't going to get that state. Trump is going to get that state. So it's one of many states that I think Trump is going to get over Joe Biden. And so, um, yeah, I just think it, it, a lot of things went wrong in this primary. Can you talk a little bit in depth to the viewers about what happened with Chuck Roach and Jeff Weaver and how they really hijacked the campaign along with all the consultants? Yeah, so um, Jeff Weaver wasn't even supposed to be involved in the campaign because in 2016, a lot of the supporters and the, the people who had worked with Bernie said that he was not somebody they wanted to work with and he was supposed to not really be involved and then he ended up being involved off the record and then somehow he ended up being one of Bernie's top advisors and that became a huge issue because he hired Chuck Rocha, who then um, hired a lot of the other problematic staff, a lot of his friends, people who were consultants from the consultant class. And they used this sort of identity politics facade to say that the Bernie Sanders campaign was diverse, full of Latinos, et cetera. But what they failed to really be honest about was that a lot of these people um, were just like hired charlatans. I mean, they were not here for the movement. They were here for the money. I mean, Chuck Rocha spent a lot of the campaign money. So did Jeff Weaver. So did other people that were hired. They were paid a lot of money. And they didn't really get the results. Many times Chuck Rocha has gone on mainstream media to say, like, he got the Latino vote, which is false. He was barely in California. When he was in California, he would just talk about his consultant company um, with his hashtag, hashtag Brown Consultants Matter. And um, it was all about him. It was That's what it was. And they did the hiring top down. So they never hired any grassroots people who had experience for important leadership positions. Instead, they were volunteers or field organizers. So back in um, last year, in 2019, we already knew this was a problem. And a lot of people in California decided to write a letter saying, hey, um, dear Bernie Sanders, we are not okay with the way the uh, campaign is treating us here. And um, the, the, like we sp specified exactly who, uh, you know, it was several people in, in California that were involved. It was several people, um, we, we specified it to California, but it was a lot of people were having problems in many other states, but I think California got the brunt of it. So there was a letter, the letter never made it to Bernie Sanders, or if it did, it was completely discounted, nothing changed. The campaign made it clear they didn't want the field organizers really working with the grassroots here. They saw them as a 
um, as, as an opponent, as an opposing force instead of somebody that could help them. And so a lot of people weren't really in it this time. There was a lot less excitement because the way the campaign made people feel. And then basically um, that continued throughout the whole campaign. And I traveled to other states and I found similar results, some better than others, of course. In New Hampshire, they, they were able to get rid of a guy named Joe Cayazzo. Joe Cayazzo was the, uh, uh, he was the, the New Hampshire lead and he was able to, uh, they were able to get rid of him because they were able to really see that they stood up to it right away and they, and then they got rid of him. He was just reassigned to another location, but then he went to work for Joe Kennedy. So you could just see all of the establishment, um, you know, things in there. You know, people like David Sirota, Nina Turner, Brianna Joy Gray, but those three people seem like they were really pushing Bernie to take the gloves off, to really fight. Yeah. Yeah, that's the million dollar question. I mean, a lot of people are still wondering uh, why Bernie Sanders did not listen to these people because they were they were right. His media team was right on the money. So was Nina Turner. And they wanted him to really be more aggressive, take the gloves off. And they were pushed out. Um, and instead in their place was Foz, uh, Jeff Weaver and Chuck Roach. Uh, Jeff Weaver and Bernie Sanders have a relationship for years for years. And I think Bernie Sanders is just one of those people that is loyal and that did not see this coming. He did voice his opinion. Uh, this, I mean, this is a fact. He did voice his opinion to the media that he was not happy with what Jeff Weber was doing with the super PAC. But that was after the fact. And a lot of people are asking themselves, you know, and nobody has gotten a straight answer. Like, why is Bernie Sanders so loyal and even those closest to him can't really understand it but he is this guy that he has this uh, moral code it seems where he won't to him going low is pretty much being un like you know he didn't campaign enough like he he was acting like he was a senator he wasn't really going after joe biden the way he should have and so a lot of people had an issue with that and um we weren't the only ones so the fact that he didn't listen i think it's it's just bernie and it's also the fact that he trusted people that he shouldn't have trusted this party platform is it really doing anything or is it just more of crumbs and a, a symbolic gesture to the progressive media and the progressives uh, in general <laughs> on the campaign yeah no it's absolutely nothing it's i mean it's just bs um first of all the the people on that board you have john Kerry in there do we really think john Kerry is going to do anything you have people like simone sanders one of uh, biden's uh you staunchest, you know, act uh, like advocates who has been going after Bernie Sanders and all of his supporters online has been constantly harassing them. Do we really think she's just going to magically change overnight? And then we also have the fact that the delegates chosen to go to the convention, and this is something I also talked on Jimmy Dore about, is those delegates that were chosen were all vetted in the way that they could not be somebody that did not like Joe Biden. If you had ever said never Biden or said something that they deemed negative about Joe Biden or a personal attack about Joe Biden, which is pretty much even just policy differences according to the campaign, um, then you were blacklisted from being a delegate. So all these activists that have been working for years, for five years, you know, for Bernie, who have been doing everything for Bernie, were completely blacklisted and left out the majority of the people put in their place were pro-Biden. Like, so they were friendly to Biden. They had supported Warren or a lot of these people. They weren't hardcore Bernie supporters. So the Bernie supporters were really livid about that. And so those people are going to go, the people that are, are chosen can then run. And then, if, and then if they're voted on, then they go to the convention and they're going to be the ones doing the whole uh, platform, you know, unity reform commission some people are under the idea that they're going to get something out of biden that they're somehow magically going to convince them to get medicare for all and a green new deal um and i think that's very naive because it's all a show it's all symbolic we have zero leverage bernie sanders gave up his leverage when he dropped out and then of course the campaign is being run still by who knows who who are demanding that the only people that go are are people that aren't going to provide opposition which is the point of doing that the point is to stand up when you go to a convention the point is to advocate the most progressive 
thing you can, usually for your candidate, but if not, then to get something for the people. But if you're going to send in people there who are already saying they're going to vote blue no matter who, then what the hell is the point? And so that's, that's, that's the whole thing. Yeah. I was just going to say one other thing is that they have this NDA and the social media contract that they have been pushing. That is really, really ridiculous. It's super, super, um, it's just a lot of censorship and it's over the top. And this, it basically says that you can't speak negatively about Joe Biden, basically, because there's no other candidate now. That you can't say anything that they deem inappropriate. You can't say anything without the consent of the campaign. And these are delegates. These aren't employees. So people are, um, there's a, a petition going on against that because people are not happy about it as well. So. These corporatists were more in charge. That's the thing. Like in 2016, for instance, the delegates were free to say whatever they wanted. In 2016, the grassroots was definitely more involved. The, the, the campaign didn't even get there in California until really late. And the grassroots was already in leadership positions where they were able to have more control. Whereas in 2020, everything was strictly controlled. Like I'm talking like you could not, they could not associate with the grassroots if the campaign deemed it so. And that's what happened. Like there was no association. There was, it was very top bottom, hierarchical, very, very much run like a typical corporation, like a typical establishment campaign. And that really just, I think that hurt Bernie with a lot of people. I think he lost a lot of those independents, those libertarians, and those conservatives who thought he uh, was different when he started also strategy-wise changing his tune. If we recall in 2016, he was more focused on the working class economics. He was saying things like, we shouldn't focus on Donald Trump. We, should focus, we shouldn't be just focused on, on the racial divide, but um, the economic divide as well. He didn't dismiss the racial divide. But, you know, the economic divide was something he focused on. And then he got a lot of criticism for it from the liberal mainstream media. And this time around, the people in charge, their strategy, as I was told, was to always focus on not his, his, uh, his base. So his base was considered, was taken for granted. Bernie's base, we're not going to focus on them. They're going to vote for Bernie no matter what. We're going to focus on the people that might like Bernie but you know aren't necessarily convinced and that was the centrist so their their focus was to get the centrist vote when instead their focus should have been to get the independent vote the libertarian vote the the outsider vote the people who vote green the people who don't vote that should have been the focus and there wasn't a focus on that at all they didn't make the most of the college campus focus either um he still got a lot of the youth vote of course they had to wait seven hours to vote but the the that's not saying he didn't you know that there couldn't have been improvements on that but to me it was it showed that you know there was yang there was tulsi gabbard there was those people that got some of the the votes he had in 2016 because he started talking like a typical liberal when he was saying donald trump is the most pre dangerous president in modern history the republicans are this and he never really attacked the democrats when he did his you know on twitter or certain speeches there were moments in 2020 when you saw him like at a rally when I when he was at a rally. I think it was a rally in um, Las Vegas. And I remember him saying something about Democrats being corrupt and the entire uh, outside cheered because they loved it when he attacked the Democrats equally like the Republicans. And he stopped doing that as much. And that definitely pushed a lot of people away. A lot of people saw that that wasn't that wasn't the Bernie in 2016. And then, you know, he, he really, he really just thought that he was going to overwhelm the electorate when he didn't address the election issues from 2016 either. So that was a whole other thing. Like he had a plan for Iowa, but he didn't have a plan for the states that weren't a caucus. And the whole time we were told that, oh yes, the campaign's got it handled. They have a plan. When we brought up to question hey, you guys, they're, they're going to get provisional ballots because of this. We were told directly by Rafa Navar and Jeff Weaver that, no, we were wrong, that that's not the case. And then the LA uh, field director went as far as to say, tell the, the field organizers sharing our video to stop spreading unsubstantiated theories. So it, it was like this establishment urge to really go look at um, – to not focus on the actions and look at more of the optics. They were all about optics. I mean, even when I was in Iowa and I was told to help out 
um, and share something where they needed precinct captains. I had, I, I got bullied by the entire campaign all the way to national because they said that tweet was not okay. And it's like, I'm sorry, but I don't work for you. Damn. Like <laughs> I'm a journalist and these people, they got their, they got their, um, they, they got it, they fixed it. But what it was is the campaign didn't want to look good. The camp and didn't want to look bad. They wanted to make sure that they kept the appearance that they were doing their job. The problem was they weren't. Even Bernie Sanders, who voted for the first bill, the CARES Act, um, you know, he got uh, understandably so a lot of criticism. I understand where he's coming from. We need to get people something. And I'm glad that he was pushing the $600 a week, even though he wasn't the only the one that wrote it. Um, I'm glad. I'm, gl I'm glad that he tried, but to me, it's like uh, that's not enough. I mean, you know, even now, like twelve hundred, another twelve hundred dollar payment, and Nancy Pelosi is out there showing her twenty five thousand dollar fridge, um, and and telling people, yeah, I don't want, you know, we don't want double dipping. We don't want you to get six hundred, and then the twelve hundred. That's too much money, and they're not even listening to what's going to happen after this. After people start reopening, you're right. A lot of those jobs aren't coming back. A lot of those businesses are starting to close. I'm already seeing people's businesses close because they never got their money or they have too many uh, requirements attached to their PPP. And it's, it's really, really bad. And they're like, they, they think if they put enough money into the stock market, into corporations, that it's just going to carry the whole economy. And what they don't realize is they haven't just screwed the working class, they're screwed the middle class too, what's left of it. I mean, they, the, the small business owners that have these mom and pop shops, those people, they're likely going to have a really difficult time coming back. Even no matter how much takeout you get from a restaurant, it's not going to give them enough money that makes up for the amount of volume they would get uh, when everything's open. And things are opening in phases, so it's still going to be a while before things get fully back up. And these politicians aren't doing anything about it. So I think I think what has to happen, and I think what the Bernie Sanders progressives and all these people that are feeling let down need to realize is that in America, we are completely lazy in terms of our advocacy, in terms of our protests. We don't protest for things that matter. Like we don't protest. You'll you'll see like the pussy hat protests, but you won't see the uh, people protesting for economic equality as much. We need more of that. We need to be more like the yellow vests in France. And what I'm saying is the electorate isn't the only answer. For moments in history we've seen in the civil rights movement, the women's movement, everything has come from people rising up. We, a lot of this stuff didn't just happen through um, the electorate first. What pushed the electoral change and what pushed a lot of the uh, judicial change were people rising up and demanding things. So I think we need to demand no longer ask, no longer worry if we're being polite or if we're being, um, you know, just bold and, and demanding because that's exactly what we need to be. We need to be demanding. We need to be disruptive. We, we need that disruption. We need to make these people uncomfortable. And, and that's the only way we're going to get what we want, whether it's through a general strike movement, whether it's, uh, you know, marching through to D.C. when we're able to, and, and demanding Medicare for all. I mean, this is like, if Joe Biden, why would you vote for Joe Biden? If he's literally telling you he's not going to give, he's going to veto Medicare for all. He's not going to approve it. That is the bare minimum at this point, supporting Medicare for all. I mean, I still, I mean, I care about uh, our civil liberties. I care about foreign policy. I care about the election integrity issue. I care about all these things. But if, if you go there and you can't even get Medicare from all for, from Joe Biden, what the hell, like, what are we doing? We're, we're not going to get anything. And I think it has to come from the people. We need to stop looking to politicians to solve our problems. A lot of that is going to come from people. And the good thing, the like one good thing about all of this is that everybody is affected by this. Like it's not just people who are political, people who are not political, who have never been political, are now realizing that they can't pay their rent, that they're gonna lose their business. And so this is now a way to get these people involved and to really, really like see, like let them see like these, these people are screwing you. And, you know, since we're still in a pandemic, people are kind of still figuring out what they're doing. There's been more time for people to start figuring out what the government is doing. And we need to really, really jump in on that. Because if we don't, this is a really, really lost moment for us where we could have done something. Um, and again, it's just going to take the people really, really rising up. And do you feel like Gavin Newsom is doing a good job? I actually don't feel like Gavin Newsom is doing a good job. I mean, I think that's what people hear 
in mm -hmm. other states that are uh, conservative led. Because I, I went to Florida recently and, um, you know, I saw they started opening up and I didn't, I didn't really see a, a problem with what they were doing. And I saw mostly small businesses really being the ones that are like anxious to open up. And then I go back to, well, why do these small businesses want to open up? Oh, because they're not getting their money. And so I think there's a lot going on here in the pandemic. I'm not saying that is not anything serious and I definitely think it is, but I also think that like you said, you mentioned the, the censorship, the privacy violations. The uh, Congress is continuously pushing this legislation right out before our eyes and using the pandemic as an excuse, um, which is putting a lot of people uneasy. They're also not giving us a monthly UBI like they should be. Um, they're also not giving us Medicare for all. So I don't believe, I believe if the government really wanted to save us, if the government really wanted to save lives, they would be providing people all the needs to stay quarantined. Okay, you want to stay quarantined? Let's not open up until we make sure every single person, everything goes down flat. Then give people the money to stay home. Give small businesses the money. Um, that's not happening. We're not getting Medicare for all. Not everybody can get a test. Um, here, if you want an antibodies test, it's like $300. So, I mean, all of these things just don't lead, lead me to believe that any of these politicians have any sort of care in the world for what happens to people. Now, I think reopening has to happen because they're not giving us anything, right? So the way to do it, um, I think, has to be responsible. But I think it's it definitely, I don't see anything wrong with reopening. It, we're kind of doing the same thing that Florida is, by the way. Um, we started mm -hmm. reopening certain parts. Los Angeles is behind. Orange County, which is Republican-led, is already having people at the beaches. I don't know if you saw yesterday, Venice Beach was, um, yeah. uh, they were putting pictures of Venice Beach over the weekend. And a lot of places, they're all open. And I just don't know if that's even, you know, I genuinely, I believe this disease is, um, it's, uh, it, it, it's real, but I also think the majority of people are asymptomatic. So unfortunately, while people in Florida, um, there was, you know, they're trying to make sure their numbers are low enough. Our numbers here are, are um, higher than in Florida. And we're still kind of operating the same way. And by the way, Gavin Newsom, he has been better than, I guess, some of the worst governors out there, at least better than Cuomo. But he is still not allocating the funds directly. They just cut the... Uh, the budget for everything in the city except law enforcement they raised the budget for law enforcement which translates to criminal prosecution there are people protesting the police right now at a, a town el monte six miles from now because they were beating up on young kids and they caught it on video and all of these things i mean there's still there's all of this going on in LA. There's the homeless crisis that has gotten worse and it's getting worse. I, I know my friends who have, uh, have uh, uh, this organization called Urban Partners LA and they're feeding the homeless or getting groceries for everybody, not just the homeless. And they started seeing people who are business class, who are, you know, who are in suits and stuff, start coming and getting in line because they're not getting the money. Mm. We also have a lot of undocumented people here who are not getting anything. And they've started to go out and work, whether it's, you know, like ice cream trucks or some sort of carts that aren't necessarily a, a whole business. So they that that's what's happening here. I don't think any of our politicians are doing enough. I think mm. Gavin Newsom should have given Californians the money because it's expensive to live here in general let alone with a $1,200 like stipend, stipend. It's interesting that you mentioned that, um, that Trump's numbers are going down because I've seen the opposite in other polls. And it's funny coming in from Florida, I've been hearing the same thing from Floridians. Oh yeah, Trump's numbers are going down. Joe Biden's, uh, you know, he could win because Trump's handling the coronavirus very badly. Well, here's the thing. Trump isn't the only one handling the coronavirus badly. Mm -hmm. Congress, Senate, they're all handling it very badly, all of them. And people are seeing that. And also we have the Democratic Party right now um, and Joe Biden and Barack Obama under the scope of Obamagate, like the way they manipulated this whole thing in line and Biden's dealings in Ukraine and the regime change in Ukraine and the money in Ukraine, all of these things that um, are real and all of the, the charade of Russiagate all of that is coming back to haunt the Democrats. And I, I think that it's a lot worse than they think. I think that the Democrats are only talking to people who are Democrats in their echo chamber and thinking, well, yeah, Donald Trump is handling this really bad. Um, 
but they're not seeing that what how they look like how t terrible they look and if they wanted to win which i don't think they want to win at this point with a progressive um they would pick somebody like bernie sanders to replace joe biden at this yeah. point they could go to the convention and replace joe biden with whoever the hell they want and i think that's another reason why they don't want uh, a convention or that it might be virtual or they definitely don't want people that are aggressive or disruptive as delegates because i think they might try to replace joe biden with somebody else and that's like a 1968 uh convention in wisconsin that didn't happen um that hasn't happened in years but they are under the full uh legal uh ability to do so they could do that and they were not gonna do it they're not gonna replace him with bernie sanders unfortunately so do you think cuomo then a lot of people are saying Cuomo, and the thing with Cuomo is, um, you know, I like the leftists in New York are calling him out for gutting Medi uh, Medicaid over there and right. for closing down hospitals, cutting the budget of all of this, like during a pandemic. Well, he's I also got a big problem. In the, I don't know if, sorry to interrupt you. I don't know if you heard about it, but he's got a big problem with the nursing home issue where he's sending people back yeah. into the nursing homes that uh had the coronavirus they supposedly got rid of it sent them back in and that's why they have a huge mm -hmm. outbreak in their nursing homes over there so that's a big issue too with people and, uh, along with what you said about the medicaid too Sorry yeah to that and also um the the prison reform a lot of people mm -hmm. have and our rikers have been asking for protections and they haven't gotten it so they this is i mean he is not a great politician but the media has spun him as somebody great I mean, I think that would be a, a, a long shot. And now they're saying Buttigieg. They're going to just throw every name out there. But um, I think uh, Biden's uh, vice presidential nominee is going to be a woman, obviously. And I think um, that they think that, oh, that's, that's going to be it. That's going to get them the votes. And they're so wrong. I just don't think, I think they're so arrogant that they don't see exactly like how bad it is. But I also think that the people at the very top, they're like, well, if we lose, at least we don't have a change in the status quo. With the Bernie Sanders, this is why they were out to stop him. They would have a change in the status quo. They would all be out of jobs. And so that's, that, that's what they don't want. So, okay, a loss to Donald Trump, I guess that would suck, but everything else remains the same for them, so. Can you give us any hope of any politicians that will have the balls, basically, to call out Nancy Pelosi or all these corrupt Democrats? Um, it's up to us to also push the politicians. So just because people like the squad, like AOC and Regina Tlaib and all that, doesn't mean you don't criticize them constructively. It doesn't mean you don't say, hey, why aren't you calling out Nancy Pelosi? You were there to be opposition to the status quo, not become a part of it, not call her mama bear, not do all these things yeah. that you know you're doing. And it just goes to show you that Dem Enter doesn't really work because you don't change the party, the party changes you. Now, I do advocate for doing what we can with the candidates we have right now. You mentioned Shahid Batar. I believe that that is one of the most important races, if not the most important race. Some, uh, if not more important than the presidency at this point, removing Nancy Pelosi would remove the gatekeeper against all progressive policy. Um, and that would be a, a defeat. It's a very uphill climb because of our system, because she has all the money, et cetera. But I think if he were not to do it this time, he could do it the next time. Um, and then there are people that are running that I, you know, that are also uh, like Jen Perlman in Florida, Broward County, um, running against Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Right. I think she's also one to support getting rid of Debbie Wasserman Schultz would be amazing. Yeah. Um, and there are just other progressives you can support down ballot. And I think you can look to that. But also, again, like, look at this as an opportunity to, to understand that we need to, the left or the progressives or the anti-establishment, whatever you call yourselves, need to be able to organize to have infrastructure so the establishment doesn't come in and get positions like Jeff Lee and Chuck Rocha did in a Bernie Sanders campaign. So we have our people that we trust. This is why we need to know who who's with us and who isn't and we need to not we need to call out those capitulating to the establishment at every end and we need to stand firm in our convictions that it's not okay to vote for for joe biden just because of trump when you know you can look at policies and you can see that joe biden's record is already far more awful than donald trump's and um you can just get out of your emotions of you know the the need to hate donald trump and and, and things like that and this isn't at all advocating for Donald Trump, but it's it's understanding that there, we have to attack the 
the the core issue that el- got him elected, which was the neoliberalism of the uh, Obama Biden administration, absolutely was, and the, the foreign policy of Hillary Clinton that put many people out of a job. And until we do that, um, you know, we're not really going to succeed. And I think it's going to. I think what we have to look forward to is that now everything is is being unmasked and unveiled, and we're seeing things for really what they are. We're seeing yeah. politicians, even people like Bernie who for 40 years, and I thank him, you know, he's the reason a lot of us are here having conversations like this. So I'm never going to call him a sheep herder or a seller. I don't think he is that. I think he's he's a very nice guy. I think he doesn't know sometimes, he trusts the wrong people. And I think that um, he's tired. And I think it's time like he to pass the torch. And I think he's passing the torch to a lot of us. And I think we need to, you know, stop looking for heroes and yes. sort of be our own heroes. And this is this is the kind of, I think, the the hubris of it all is that it, it, everything went wrong. We're at a point where we're all disappointed. We're all scared. We're all unsure of what's going to happen. But out of this uncertainty is where we go and create something that is actually going to be more of a revolution. I think that's what it's going to take. It's not going to be just a simple thing. I think we're going to have to see protests. We're going to have to see people actually rise up in order to see the change we want. Right. Fiorella, Isabel, thanks so much for coming on the program. She's on the car couch with pasta. Thank you, Rob. Much appreciated. Thank you for having me on. And uh, I'm on Twitter, uh, Fiorella underscore I am, if you guys want to follow me there.